It can be a surprisingly short journey from drinking with friends on a Saturday night to a 20-year sentence in the state pen. Statistics show a grim connection between alcohol, drugs, and Native American imprisonment. The toll can be heavy, the loss in human potential enormous. Many Indian youth end up in treatment centers, institutions, and hospitals. Those who end up behind bars see everything they could have been disappear with the closing of the prison door. There are 27 correctional facilities in the state of Oklahoma, but there's only one maximum security prison known as Big Mac in McAllister. It houses hardcore, high-risk criminals. As 39-year-old Indian inmate Richard Walker has experienced, prison is a grim and frightening place. Richard is a five-time loser, serving five consecutive sentences in Big Mac for burglary. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, I'm not blaming nobody else but myself. And because uh, I'm the one that went out, went out and got trouble, got in trouble. And <clears throat> I don't know if this has anything to do with it or not, but I was five years old when my father passed away. He died of a heart attack back in 52. And uh, when I was being brought up, it was just my mother. I had four sisters and one brother, and I'd do what I want and just get away with a lot of stuff, and I was spoiled. I was a baby of the family, and I felt I was spoiled. I'd get in my way, and then I started drinking beer when I was about nine. And I, my grandfather and uncle, they'd drink all the time, so I'd be with them, and I'd sit on their lap and just start drinking. That's where I started drinking beer. <clears throat> then, as I was still, you know, being growing up. I just started liking beer and started drinking, drinking. And when I was a teenager, I started drinking again. And just that was just my downfall. That's my weakness. That was my weakness. I'd be alcohol every time I get in trouble. It was alcohol related. Every time, every single last time. And just. Things got from worse to worser, you know, and that's been my downfall, just getting, every time I'd get in trouble, I'd hit the bottle first and then go out. Probably didn't realize what I was doing. Vaguely remember, but I'd uh, get in trouble. And next thing you know, it, I'd uh, commit a felony and they'd, uh, file charges on me. I go to court. There were some young inmates just come in here. Okay, they get with people that are maybe the big shots, the high rollers or whatever, and because they, they want to be with somebody that'll, you know, help them out or something. Watch out on because they're scared. They won't admit it, but they're scared. All right, and they get involved with different things. Any, all, all kinds of things in prison. They get involved with homosexuality, uh, beer drinking, gambling, dance, and everything. They get involved with that. But deep down inside, they don't want to get involved. But they do because they don't want to get stabbed. They don't want to get beat up. They don't want to get uh, go to protection. That's why they're involved. Since I've been locked up, the majority of my time has been here in OSP, McAllister. And I've seen senseless killings. I've seen a guy get killed over a pack of cigarettes. I've seen a guy get killed just over a argument, over a basketball game out there where they go out and play among each other. It's, uh, 
So that's why every day you wake up and get up and get out of your cell, you got to, the way I look at it, the way I do, I just, you know, I'm fixing to leave my cell. And I go down there and say, well, I'm going to watch my step every day. And I do. But uh, I've seen guys get killed because they were too drunk. They pick a fight. And anymore, if you start a fight and you're, you have to kill the guy. Very seldom you'll see two guys that got in a fight go talk it over. There's always, they separate them. Once they get a chance to creep on them or get them, they'll kill them. But it's uh, just, it's possible every day a guy can get killed every day. Very possible. Twenty-four-year-old David Harjo is serving a 20-year sentence in the pen for robbery. Though his journey took a different course, David's destination was the same as Richard's, behind bars. It's my second uh, time in the joint. I done a prior offense of uh, robbery by force a few years ago, about six years ago. And, uh, I got about four years done on this one. You know, I was, um, I guess I was always a little wild, you know. Mom and Dad, they was, they're Christians, you know, and uh, they'd always tell us about, uh, you know, Christian life and about all this and uh, But it never sunk into my head. I was always where I wanted to do things like you know, average teenager want to do this and, you know, do that. But I always wanted to be a little bit more than that, you know, like I want to do things my way and I don't want to be grounded and I don't want to do this because I don't want to, nobody tell me what to do, you know. And they, they tried their best to teach me that, but... Uh, I just want to be my own person, and uh, so I got involved uh, my own way of doing things, and, uh, and it eventually led uh, you know, further and further, and finally in here. You know. I think about a lot of things, like you know, I, you know, I'll be doing back here. Like I've got two daughters out there now, and I could be out there raising them, but uh, you know, just one of them things where, you know, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot about that. But then, you know. It kind of bothers me when I think about that, so I try not to, but it's hard not to, you know. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of things I'd be doing out there, but uh, I don't got nobody blaming myself, really. And uh, I just got to take it from here, you know. <laughs> I used to drink, drink whiskey and, uh, and everything, boy, and uh, I never did take dope very much, but a couple of my buddies turned me on to some stuff. When I'd get all wild and stuff, and, uh, one time I went to this bar, man, and I busted this dude in the face, man, because uh, I didn't like him, man. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that till the next day, you know, they told me. And uh, I said, well, he must have done something to me to try to justify my actions. But they said, well, the guy didn't do nothing. And I said, well, he must have, you know, because uh, you know, when, you, when you're drunk and, and all high and all, you just really feel good. And I know I, I used to get out of it, man. To, you know, I used to do stuff that I didn't even remember doing, man. And, uh, and uh, that just, I mean, that was all part of the, you know, where I was growing up and just, I don't know, it just fake me. You know, the alcohol and all this, man, it just, a lot of my decisions, man, when I was kind of wild, it, it affected me a lot. You know, and, uh, it, I'd act irrationally. I, mean, I, I always heard stories about the joint and everything, and uh, was going to Lexington, you know, and uh, the receiving center is, and I had long hair then, and I didn't want to cut my hair. And, uh, I was in line, and I was thinking, man, I ain't going to cut my hair. And uh, But the inmate was a barber, you know, and, uh, and stuff. I, mean, that, I thought it was a, I thought it was a police barber, but it was an inmate. He said, you're next. And I said, nah, nah, I can't, I can't handle this, man. And they said, well, you're going to have to cut it, or the guards will cut it for you, whichever, however you want to do it. And I said, ain't nobody going to cut my hair. And, and I found this other inmate said, well, you better do it, man, while you got to, you know, do it, cut it the easy way, or they do it the hard way. So I said, all right, all right. But I sat up on that barber chair like, hey, all right, man, you know, you know. You know. It takes, it's going to take the police to cut my hair, so I'll go ahead and, and I try to be all tough about it, you know, but they cut my hair and everything. And it really, the whole feeling of it didn't sink in until I was in my cell uh, that night. And I was thinking, man, I, I'm here in the joint, man. You know? and, uh, I had a number and everything. You know? they, at, back then, they call you by, by your number. You know? Me and three other in, in dudes and buddies, we got drunk and, uh, and whooped this one dude over here, uh, over here by Rotunda, was coming out of mess hall. And, and a partner fired him up, man. And uh, these key men didn't see nothing. Right away, they said, uh, uh, I guess the naturally they thought Indians get drunk and they, you know, they're the troublemakers. Uh, right away, the head, head guard said, uh, 
the Indians done it, you know. Boy, we went up to Full Run up here, and everybody locked down. They was locking everybody down. And they tried to call us out here, but we wouldn't come out here. And everybody locked down, except us Indians. We was drunk, you know. And, uh, and we broke off some broom handles and stuff, and, uh, and uh, we put our headbands on and stuff. And uh, we said, let's come on with it, you know. And they come in from the front and come in from the back. And uh, they had right, right helmets and on and everything, man. I ain't never seen that many police in all my life, man. They come in from the front and the back. They had a front leading a mattress. The one coming in from the front, when they were swinging them sticks, and uh, from the back they had, they was coming in, man. And that leader, the leader of it, from the back had his shield up, and he was fixing to lay a good one on my head. Well, he, he was back to that club like that. When I laid into him, hit him in the mouth, and boy started fighting. We just all got down with it, boy. And they whooped the hell out of us. Man. <laughs> they had us down and put leg irons and uh, handcuffs on us and was kicking on us and took us out of Rotunda and, you know, beat us up pretty good and uh, took us out to the infirmary. One day, man, I just felt so tired, man, I, and I, I just got on my, got my cell and got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I said, uh, it's getting heavy, man. Uh, it's getting heavy, man. I said, I can't, I can't handle this no more. I said, I'm tired of lock up. And I said, I can't handle it no more, man. I said, I'm just, you know, help me, you know. And I just threw up my arms, man. I said, I'm, I give up, you know. And, uh, well, right then, uh, it seemed like, man, it just a burden lifted off, man. I felt real good, you know, feeling, man. I just, man, uh, and I said, praise the Lord, man. I was in my cell, man. I said, praise the Lord, man. Then, uh, then I looked at my at my door to see if no guard was passing by and see me, you know. <laughs> so I said, I said, you know. Then I said, well, what? The? I said, I feel great. I was thinking to myself, I feel great, man. Captain Bob Bryant, who has been with the state penitentiary system for 10 years, knows firsthand the tense, explosive atmosphere produced by long-term confinement. Well, I guess one of the worst things I've seen here at OSP was one, my first two weeks as an officer here. I was a correctional officer cadet, trainee, and uh, the first inmate that I saw killed was an Indian inmate that had been dead for probably two or three hours, that had already been stiff, his throat had been slashed. And uh, it's something that, you know, it was awful, kind of hard for me to put out of my mind, because it was uh, the first time I'd seen anybody killed, and it had to be an Indian, and that just struck home with me, because he was an Indian. Most of our Indian inmates are in here for robbery, burglary, small, petty crimes like that. Uh, we do have a couple on, on death row. Uh, the Indian inmates here, that's one reason we tried to form the Indian Club, give them something to do, give them something to join together. Uh, it gives them a chance to, some of them, that's their form of religion. They practice, uh, they grew up around the powwow stomp grounds, and that's, uh, that we do have uh, church services here where they can, you know, they can go to church. Uh, 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 I find that most of the Indian population here is from the Baptist background. They either went to a Baptist church or their families were Baptist. When you come into the penitentiary, especially if you're a young Indian, that, that's something that you're going to have to face is homosexuality. Uh, whether you, uh, you want to be or not, you may be forced into that situation in order to, to save your life. Uh, a lot of Indians probably on the street or in any inmate wouldn't be that way, but it's it's forced upon him. It's something he has to do for his own for his own protection. You know, he wants to live, so he'll he'll do anything. But it's it's a problem that uh, we we always contend with here. And there's you know, but it, it's still here. It's it's something that we we can't totally stop. I've seen a lot of Indians come and go from this institution, and a lot of them are repeat offenders. So there's you know there's something somewhere that we're not doing right because they keep coming back. And that's the biggest problem I see here is that the Indian populations, ones I see leave within within a year or two years, they're back. Uh, and most of them tell me a big part of their problem is they get out on the street. They don't have no skills, no education, no training. They can't find a job, so the first thing they do is they go rob or steal mm -hmm. to make money. And they get caught, they're back in, they're back in the penitentiary again. And uh, like I say, a lot of them are repeat offenders, so they'll uh, end up with a 
doing 20, 30 years for maybe a real small burglary because they, they've got that after former label on them then. You got a lot of young Indian inmates in, in the institution. Uh, but most of them that are, that are young that come in this institution are high school dropouts, you know. They didn't, they didn't finish school. They didn't have nothing to do. They run around and start drinking and getting on drugs and first thing you know they're in trouble and they end up in, the, in an institution. And of course this being a maximum security institution, it, it's uh, this institution here has got the, the worst of the crop, you know. This, this is it right here it's at OSP. But a lot of times uh, when the, it seems like when an Indian an Indian inmate gets out of the penitentiary, he's kind of on his own. He gets out of the penitentiary and he goes back to his family, back home to the same background that he got in trouble. He goes back to the same town that he come from because that's where, uh, if an Indian inmate gets out of here and he's from McAllister, he's going to, usually he stays in McAllister. He gets out, out on the street and he runs around with the same crowd that he ran around with before he came in here and then he's right back in the penitentiary. Uh, he doesn't get a job, he just, you know, loafs around and starts on drugs or alcohol, and then and he's going to end up right back in here. Prison life is a reality for many women as well. 305 women prisoners are confined at Mabel Bassett Correctional Center in Oklahoma City. Theodosia Wheeler. A grandmother has been incarcerated at Mabel Bassett four years. In her case, the link between alcohol abuse and imprisonment is clear. When I was growing up, uh, when I got a can of beer or a quart of wine, I thought I was, you know, hey, I did something real. It was just taboo, but I mean, hey, I did it, you know. But uh, if they gave me drugs back then, I wouldn't know what it was. You know, I just couldn't, but I knew I could relate the ideal of, of alcohol and uh, 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 beer, mm -hmm. but I didn't know anything else. I never have tried drugs, you know. Uh, I tried uh, alcohol when I was uh, maybe about 16, 17, and I stayed with it. And when I get out of here, I don't know how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just have to, I tell myself every, every day that I don't need it because this is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't control it. I'm not a, a social drinker. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I didn't know what the word social drinker meant. I thought, you know, if you get two people together, that's being social, <laughs> you, know? you know. And it got so that I, I didn't need two to drink. I just need one, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been in here three years, February 17th in the system the last time. Uh, I'm doing a total of 41 years. Uh, right now I'm doing a 20, and I got 20 piggyback with that. Then I got a 21 back of this one. I guess I'm not a what you call, I come from a good family. Uh, the white people would say upper middle class. Uh, I never need it for anything. Uh, and right now if they say tweet, you can go home as you if you'll promise to stay on your, live within your income. I have enough income to uh, not starve, uh, but uh, I don't have enough for my alcohol. And to have alcohol, I have to have the whole thing, the trimmings with it. You know, uh, in back of my mind, I said, well, if you're uh, um, an alcoholic, you're standing downtown holding your hands together, you know, trying to get a nickel and dime for wine. That wasn't me. Uh, but in a sense, that was me. But I had to have money to block out that part. Like, it, and I wouldn't drink wine. I'd have to drink whiskey because it was just the ideal of cost. If it cost a little more, it'd be a little better for me. But uh, alcohol has and is one of my only problems. And when I get alcohol in my system, I don't care for nothing else. I don't care about my kids. I don't care about my grandchildren. I don't care about nothing but me and that bottle. I used to didn't like myself. Now I understand myself. I still don't like a lot of things about myself, but I understand a lot of 
my feelings were uh, very selfish in the ideal that I only wanted alcohol and when I ran out of that, it seemed like I couldn't, uh, I couldn't relate to my children. I didn't know how to relate to them. I didn't know how to relate to my husband. Unless I was drinking, and then we ended up fighting. And uh, everything in the last, I say the last six or seven years have been miserable. And in that six or seven years, I have went from pretty close to $200,000 in, in one wad. I think 90% of these women in here is for stealing. You know, the other small number in here are for somebody taking a life one time only. You know, and they're doing life or better, you know. But most of them is here for stealing and drug related, but alcohol related. And uh, this is one ant paw. Sharon McMahon is also doing time for writing bad checks, having served three years of a 10-year sentence. An alcoholic justifies all of their drinking, and I always justified every drink that I drank. I never uh, put myself in the category of having a drinking problem. Uh, I worked every day. I felt like if I held down a job that uh, I deserved to have a drink, and uh, when I come to the penitentiary and really had to sit down and look at exactly why am I here, do a self-analysis, what led me to be here, it just boiled down to drinking. It was my drinking. If I hadn't have been drunk, I wouldn't have took the checks. I wouldn't have went and cashed them. And after I got to really thinking about it and everything, I had to accept that within myself that I did have a drinking problem that I was an alcoholic. The three years, I will have served three years and four months of this 10-year sentence uh, before I come up for parole. That's uh, three years away from my son that I can't never get back. Uh, I will always be a convicted felony that will follow me the rest of my life. I feel good about myself now. Of course, it's I've come a long ways in the last almost two years since I've been here. It's been an every day, every hour, every hour, and then every day, every week process of self-analysis. Um, I'm a Christian. The Lord's helped me a lot, just given me strength. It's hard for me to really, really explain what it's like to uh, lose my freedom, uh, the emotional strain that it has on you mentally. Uh, it's like walking into the unknown. I get up about 6 o'clock in the morning and I go to school, talk back TV, and I work as a teacher's aide in typing. and. Uh, when I'm not in school, I'm in typing. Uh, we eat lunch around 11.30 to 12.30. We're always having uh, counts, 12.45 counts. And then after that, uh, it's back to work or either back to school. Uh, our day ends around 4 o'clock. And we're back on our housing units. We have another count at 4.45. Uh, then supper. Then there's various activities, uh, gym activities, church activities that go on in the evenings until 9 o'clock. And uh, back on the quad and get ready for the next day. I feel like that rehabilitation lies within the heart of the individual. And not everybody is inclined to agree with me, but this, uh, this is the way that I've come to accept it. You know, I made a mistake, I'm paying for that mistake, but why should I uh, sit and waller in self-pity? I feel like that uh, 
I don't need to sit and wait on a bingement or anything. I've done it, figure out what I've done wrong, pick myself up and try to better myself and try to uh, be a better person so I won't have to come back. So many times the young people, and I, as I look back, I always thought that my parents didn't know what they were talking about. I knew it all. And uh, that's, where that's where the young people make their mistake. This is what I feel that they make their mistake. Uh, if we would listen, listen to people that's older than us, they wouldn't be telling us that. I wouldn't be telling my child certain things if I didn't know through experience or know what was best for them and everything. I feel like that it just boils down to if I had listened to mom and dad. Like I said, I'm, I'm a Christian. I was raised in a good Christian home, and uh, so many things has come back to my mind that I've, I've been taught reading the Word, and uh, the Lord tells us, I will never leave you or nor forsake you. And at the time I was at the bottom of the pit, His love was sufficient. He reached down and lifted me up and set me on solid rock, and... Uh, God's grace is sufficient. When the sun starts going down, I think about being at home, being with my son. I can feel more blue at that time of day.